I always find music history specifically fascinating. And, you know, just talking about the studio and things like that, it, it brought up a question that I would love to ask you. But, you know, going back in the day, because we kind of touched this, touched on this a little bit, but how hard and expensive was it for you to release one song, let's say back in what, 1982 or whenever you, you started doing your thing? Explain the whole process and how the reels and, and the studio time and all of that. Because nowadays you can record an album for 20 bucks using, from your home studio. If, if that much. All you need is a good SD card. Mm-hmm. Um, man, back then, I just told the story the other day. It was a whole lot more money. I cut my first record like 400 bucks. Slice cost me like $400. Okay. I cut Slice on the 8-track. And it this out. is 80, 80s money, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't 2020. $400 doesn't sound like a lot. No, right. this is 80s money. This is 80s money. I bought, um, I think Slice cost me like 400 bucks to make. I, I rented a Lindrum. The other had a cousin, had a Lindrum. <laughs> Uh, we scratched, had some, had some turntables, just a little scratching. Um, that was my turntable. I went to the eight track, might've cost me an eight track studio. Might've cost me, I don't know, a hundred dollars, $150. Um, clientele went in and knocked it out. Bam. One time, bam. One time. No shit. He knocked it nice. out. He, he, he knocked out slice one time. Okay. One take done deal. I thought that. He spoiled me with that shit. Oh, we, they pushed report, record one time. You expected that I, after that, right? I wouldn't expect anything less. Uh huh. Um, I left there, went to the pressing plant. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. You left. You leave. The, you leave the studio. You take. Uh, you take the studio. It once it's mixed and mastered in the studio. At that time, we didn't know nothing about Bernie Grudman or none of the other uh, mixing houses. The engine, okay. It was only drums and scratching and a vocal, so it wasn't like it was no major mixing, no reverb on there. Then you take it to the plater. The plater was Richard Simpson on Santa Monica. He charged you a hundred dollars a side to no seventy five dollars a side to do your plate. So it, it and when you say side, that's a record per side, twelve inch. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. big like this, not the same size as the record, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger than a record. And they put it on what they call a lathe. Okay. They put your tape in one machine and they put this, um, it goes through this process and this little needle, they cuts the groove in this metal lathe, black lacquer, the black lacquer lathe. They call, they call them lacquers. Once you okay. get it done, you take that to the plating company. That was in Gardena. Thank God everything was pretty close to me. You leave there, then you go to Greg Lee's plating on Broadway in uh, Redondo Beach. And, and what is plating? What's they, that? They take the lathe copies, put it in a nickel bath, and then they draw, like magnetically draw this, um, this, this nickel to it, and they make a reverse copy of what they just made in the lathe. The lathe. Wow. That's reverse okay. Copy. Okay. It's a, this is some technical shit. I know mm -hmm. what it is, but I, didn't, I can't give you the scientific. No, no, I'm just curious. That's crazy, all this, the steps. Okay, then from, from that, you got what they call the, uh, the, the, uh, the mothers, okay? And the mothers is a reverse of, no, you got, you got that's the mother. Then, the, then they make the, what they call the stampers. The stampers are the reverse of the mothers, okay? One day, okay, if you remind me, I go in my garage and pull out every piece of shit I'm telling you about. I got all that shit. In my oh, head. really? No shit. All oh, I got the I got the two inch. I got the stampers. I got the mothers. I got damn. Oh, I can I went back and got all my shit from my, one of my labels. I didn't get all my stuff from Macola. I got both of it, but not all of it. But I kept all my two inch masters. I still got I got a a rack, a rack full of two inch masters. And I got mothers and stampers, and I got labels. Then once you leave uh, with the mothers and the stampers, you take them to the pressing plant, and they make you what they call a test presser to make sure that wow. everybody did their job correctly. Because anybody can fuck this up. Mm -hmm. okay? if, the, if somebody bumps the lathe, it can scratch your record. If the process and the stampers and the mother stampers not done right, you fuck it up. You can overcut wow. the slightest, the slightest bit of dust. Fucks up everything. Damn. One speck of dust can fuck up everything. Okay. Mm. 
so you then you got to go to um max gnm graphics um right next to the macola and write out your label all your label information where it was recorded mm. a song and wasn't no spell check because some of my shit was fucked up back that day you know? <laughs> ain't no computer it's all done by hand okay. yeah so you're typing and shit and you, you ain't trying to go back and then yeah no you ain't typing you writing this shit on, on a piece of oh, and give it to, damn. The, to him he was german his wife was was latino and they had to figure out your goddamn hand <laughs> that's <laughs> fucking hilarious this is this is real shit here okay damn you did that once you got your label you got your chest presses and if the chest presses was cool then you can authorize and press some records okay then you authorize pressing records the whole process from the time you leave the studio to the time you actually have a physical finished record might be seven to ten days yeah and here's the crazy part a lot of times we would take greg mac the um a, a cassette because back then you had a high bias cassette that that high bias cassette sound good as hell back in the day okay mm. would take i a remember high those cassette and cart that some bitch up and he'd be playing records on the radio before we when, soon as we soon as we leave k day it's just on the radio but I, now i got still got six to six to eight days if I could have record in, rec, records in the store, it would, it would piss McCola off because now everything got to be rushed. Because once, once the record get hot, people want it right now. And we, we didn't have it right now. So a lot of times they would have to, uh, excuse me, my eyes itching like a center room. Uh, a lot of times they would rush it uh, with a white label or whatever the case may be, just, just to get it to the stores. And uh, I do my thing with Cletus and Kelvin and uh, everybody I knew. And still, because I, I still could get it to them faster than Makota could get it to them. Because I would grab it off the, off the press, off the plant, off the pressing plant, still hot. Damn, dog. Press, nigga, I'm talking about hot. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm, waiting there, I'm waiting there for them to put them in the boxes. Okay. I'm waiting, them for, I'm waiting there. I'm waiting for them to put it in the boxes so I can throw them back. I, t- I snatch mine off before the stores got theirs. And I'm going to see Cletus, Kelvin. Fortune Records, um, whoever else I had on my list, and all the swap meets. So I got that covered, and that was my money right there and there. So, I, so me and my folks can take it, we, we could eat. And that was the process. That was the process. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Listen, kids, it's very easy now. You guys got it good now. I mean, there was actual footwork and a lot of money involved just to release one song, let alone one album. That's dope, dude. Thanks so much for sharing that, Alonzo. Um, yeah, man, what's what's coming up? Let me, let me let me say this. That was one that was one musician. When we made surgery and juice, we we're talking about fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars now for a single. Yeah, you get the real saxophones, the real whatever the case is. Well, not that was surgery and juice. We hired, okay. we hired a, a, a pretty much a one man band, a guy named Daniel Sofer. He did he had the Oberheim system. And the Oberheim system made all the horns. And the drum machines, and if you remember, surgery and juice, we got we got to make jackets now. Whole nother whole nother world. We, we Damn, made dude. Jackets for slice too, but that was kind of after Damn. the fact. But we had we got to get. I got to coordinate with Daryl, and this is part of a, this is part of my job as an executive producer, especially from an indep- independent perspective. That's my. Mm-hmm. Job. To, to make sure everybody, I'm coordinating everything. I got to make sure that Daryl Davis got the artwork, got the uh, got all the stuff for the uh, front cover, for the back cover, while the other stuff is being made. Um, while the other stuff is being made, um, while the other stuff is being coordinated, you got to try and time everything because the jackets take about two weeks. They, they and by them. jacket, by jacket, you mean the cover of the album, right? For everybody out there. What's behind me here? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All the kids out there are like jacket, the one I wear. Jackets. These are jackets. They're all, all these jackets right here were made by the same person. Okay. One guy made most of the jackets. Battle Cat, House Calls, Greatest Hits, Love Letter, uh, The Mix, CIA, Surgery Juice. One guy did all the jackets um, for rec- for Crew Cut Records. Same guy that did the Ruthless logo. Yeah. Oh, same guy. That's so dope, dude. Okay, so you know people. All people always ask me about different shit. I said, look, understand this. When it come to me and Easy, 
um, I knew Easy. Arnold knew Easy from the neighborhood. When it came to the business, I was Easy's first and only consultant until he met Jerry Heller. All He's talking about Big A, right? Big A. All mm, shout stuff, out Big A, Underworld. All the stuff that was done uh, before he went to priority was done with me. Okay? And over, and then I introduced him to my boy at uh, Audio Achievements, uh, Donovan, the surfer, uh, you know, the biker, I'm sorry. And I turned him on to his first, his lawyer, got his first contract for Rufus, turned him on to the artist that did, look at the Rufus logo and look at some of these jackets, you see the same flavor, okay? The same guy did it because that was my boy out of Compton, Daryl Lirad Davis. And this is the kind of stuff that people don't really know how, why, why we stay cool, okay? Because he knew he could, come, he knew he could trust me. It wasn't until Jerry came along that I got kind of pushed out because, you know, some of the stuff that he was able to pull on easy and some of the folks, I would have let happen because, but I wouldn't let happen if I'd have known what was going on. But by that time, mm. they were pretty much under his spell. And, uh, you know, that was, it was, you know, you don't need Lonzo no more. Okay. I'm going to make a note. I'm going to make a note to talk about that next week because that's a whole story in itself, dude. Okay. Definitely.